There's a saying, it's too late to regret, but honestly, all regrets are too late anyway. I am Kevin Thompson, and I have deep regrets that linger in my heart, so profound that I sometimes wish I could turn back time. This year, as I turn 36, I'm currently in charge of the only clinic on a remote island. Before this, I worked in a clinic in a secluded mountainous area. Back then, it was more or less an assignment from my higher-ups, but moving to this island was a choice I made on my own. This marks my sixth year here. During the summer, the town is bustling with tourists and surfers, but it's pretty quiet off-season. Summer is just around the corner. The entire atmosphere of the island will soon shift, welcoming its lively season. During the off-season, I mainly work as a family physician for the island residents, but as the number of tourists increases, we start to get a variety of patients. There's only one nurse. Her name is Catherine, a seasoned professional who's 58 this year. She's been both a professional mentor in healthcare and a life mentor to me, supporting me in many ways. She's like a mother figure to me here on the island. Having spent six years on this island, I've come to know almost every resident. There are also young folks who have returned to the island from big cities, and the local youth group, somewhat like a community club, is quite vibrant these days. I'm also a member, and during summer festivals or other events, I'm usually on standby at the first aid tent. With summer approaching, it means the festival is near. Looking at the calendar on the wall, I remembered there's a meeting for the youth group tonight. Today, there hasn't been a single patient since morning. No accidents or illnesses, which is always a blessing. I haven't received any surgery requests from the university hospital, which used to be frequent. Recently, things have been really peaceful. Even if I were to spend the rest of my life in this clinic on this island, I don't think I'd have any regrets. The venue for the youth group meeting is a pub owned by the president and his wife. They serve fresh morning codfish at incredibly affordable prices. Being terrible at cooking, this place is where I ate most of my dinners. When I first arrived, I used to live on instant noodles, and they told me a doctor shouldn't neglect his own health and insisted I dine here. The pub has a spacious room upstairs, and that's where the youth group meetings are held. Usually, the folks who never gather on time were exceptionally early today. Moreover, all the young guys were dressed rather sharp, looking different from their usual selves. I thought the atmosphere felt off, but I took a seat on one of the available chairs. Once everyone was present, the president began explaining about the summer fair. It's the same as every year, no changes. Most of the people here experienced last year's fair, so it felt more like a refresher. Once the meeting concludes quickly, it turns into a dinner party. I'd bet most attend these meetings for the fun of this party. It's also a chance for everyone to share local news, so everyone finds it valuable. Just as the draft beer was served, the private room's door opened hesitantly. Excuse me, entering while calling out was an unfamiliar woman. I doubt she's a local. Michelle, over here. The president beckoned her. She navigated through the crowd and took a seat beside him. Her brightly colored hair was loosely tied back, and her slender neck was striking. Her face, slightly sunburned, was blushing. She appeared delicate, but her posture revealed strong core muscles. Everyone, this is Michelle, Bob's cousin. She started working at Bob's surf shop a week ago. After a brief introduction, Michelle gave a small mod. She had a refined face, resembling an actress, and had recently started working at one of the few surf shops. Looking around, all the young men seemed smitten by her. That's when I realized. They dressed up because they knew Michelle would be here. Not my place to interfere in young love, but from what I saw, none of them seemed on pair with her. I sensed this summer would be quite an eventful one. After the introduction, 
Michelle was immediately surrounded by the youth, continuously offered drinks. She seemed to struggle a bit to decline, probably not much of a drinker. I watched and leisurely sipped from my glass. Of course, it's filled with ginger ale. There's only one doctor on this island. I can't afford to get drunk. While the others were enthusiastically mingling, I was discussing finer details with the president. Hey, decocter, so about Michelle, I'd like you to keep an eye on her a bit. Seems like there's some backstory with her. Backstory? I asked back, the president looking serious and nodded. Bob had directly consulted the president. Apparently, Michelle has a bedridden younger brother. She came to this island out of her brother's wish to give her a break from taking care of him all the time. He wanted her to enjoy her life. Imagining how Michelle must have felt when her brother told her that, it hurt deep inside me. I don't think she'd do anything reckless, but to keep an eye on her, okay. The president gently patted my shoulder, getting up from his seat. And then he brought Michelle from the group and had her sit beside me. Michelle took a seat on the cushion with a slight sigh of relief. They made me drink a lot. She said with a smile. Seeing her smile, I blurted out, What? You? From that time, looking at my surprised face, Michelle giggled mischievously. I thought I'd meet you again. She teased me with a slightly cheeky tone. And then she whispered in my ear. I'm still wearing that swimsuit you picked up for me. Hearing that made her appear a bit sultry. Just when I thought I was past such feelings, it turns out I'm still a man. The very daring swimsuit she referred to from that day. She said she's still wearing it. Hard not to imagine it. Michelle seemed to enjoy my flistered state, which was a bit frustrating. You've heard my introduction, right? I wanted to ask back then, but couldn't. Who are you? Considering the time, I was most likely the first person to talk to Michelle on this island. I had mistaken her for an off-season tourist then. I'm a doctor at the local clinic here. Call me Kevin. If you get injured or feel unwell, don't hesitate to contact me. Upon hearing my words, Michelle tensed up a bit. Huh, any chance you're connected with that university hospital? She mentioned the name of the university hospital I was once affiliated with. Used to be. Now I mainly focus on rural practice. On hearing this, Michelle glared at me with intense eyes. The good vibe from a moment ago disappeared and tension filled the room. From the university hospital, Kevin Thompson, why do you know my surname? I've only given my first name. The fact that Michelle knows my full name means there's some connection somewhere. But I couldn't remember at all. Um, have we met somewhere before? Just as I was about to ask her, Michelle suddenly stood up and left the private room with great momentum. Her back seemed filled with anger. The eyes of blame were on me following Michelle's abrupt exit. They must think I said something to upset her. Look, I didn't say anything wrong. The community group looked at me disapprovingly, and I found myself defensively speaking out. After that, I was surrounded and blamed by the group. A week has passed since the meeting, and I still can't remember where I met Michelle. Even if we run into each other in town, Michelle blatantly avoids me, not even making eye contact. Her profile clearly indicates a big dislike sign. I can't imagine getting into this kind of situation without a significant reason. She seems to get along with everyone else, so it's not that she dislikes this island. She definitely dislikes me. But before I introduced myself, her attitude seemed rather friendly. She totally changed her attitude after hearing my name. Doctor, it seems you're quite disliked, Catherine remarked. Word spread quickly around the island that Michelle didn't like me. It's not just dislike, it's more like, what do you mean? Prompted by Catherine, I voiced the words I hadn't shared with anyone. It's not just dislike, it feels like she deeply loathes me. 
When I let out my pent-up feelings, I felt a bit relieved. The way Michelle looks at me isn't just a dislike or hate kind of look. It's a look filled with deep resentment and loathing. In my life, I've never been so openly antagonized. It's not mere jealousy or sarcasm. It's pure hatred, animosity. Yet, I can't remember why. It's like I've forgotten something vital. I start to feel really sorry towards Michelle. I wish I could confront and apologize to her. I let out a big sigh. Well, it'll all work out in the end. If you keep looking gloomy, your patients will get worried. Encouraged by Catherine's words, I nodded firmly. You're absolutely right. It's pretty unprofessional of me to be down about something like this. The words and professional doctor that I muttered kept echoing in my heart. As summer vacation starts, the island becomes bustling. Families and surfers begin pouring into the island. Inns and bed and breakfasts are swamped, and the normally quiet town is filled with unfamiliar faces. With a temporary increase in the island's population, even the usually laid-back clinic gets busy. We get a lot of tourists who are unfamiliar with the sea, getting stung by jellyfish or cutting their feet on rocky shores. Being busy keeps my mind off other things. I had almost forgotten about Michelle for a while. I was so swamped that I felt it was a waste of time trying to remember what I couldn't. That day was hectic from the morning. A grade schooler with a stomach ache to a college girl with a cut foot. Regular elderly patients visited the clinic daily. I barely had time for lunch, and things only settled down when afternoon consultations began. I ended up wolfing down a sandwich and starting the afternoon shift. Doctor, please help Michelle. The person who barged in right as the afternoon consultation started was Bob, the owner of the surf shop. He's Michelle's cousin. Normally unflappable Bob looked panic-stricken. What happened? I tried to answer calmly. Just then, Michelle, unable to walk and supported under both arms, was brought in. Her bleeding from the legs was severe, and her thigh looked like it had been gouged by rocks. She also had numerous scrapes and abrasions. Someone was pressing a towel to her wounds, but the towel was quickly turning bright red. She tried to help a student who was about to get caught in the rocks, and then, during the surfing lesson, it seems she tried to help a student who was drifting toward the rocks and got hit by a massive wave. She must have been slammed against the rocks multiple times by the waves. On closer look, she was also bleeding from her arm. Thankfully, it didn't seem like she had broken any bones. We need to treat her right away. As I directed her to be laid on the treatment bed, the until then compliant Michelle began to resist. Her agitation made the bleeding worse. I don't want you to treat me. The atmosphere in the examination room became icy with her words. Michelle's shout was almost a scream. She must have been in pain. She kept wincing. Yet, the glare she gave me was full of intensity. Are you crazy? You need to get treated ASAP. If it gets infected, it'll be serious. Bob, who had seen many injuries before, raised his voice. But Michelle wouldn't be convinced. She dug her nails into the arm of the guy supporting her and kept glaring at me. She was like a wounded stray cat. Her defense is up. She was trying hard to seem strong. I don't care if you hate me or whatever. Just let me treat you as a doctor. That's my purpose in life. I raised my voice in desperation, seeing the amount of blood flowing from her. Hearing my outburst, Michelle smiled faintly with a pale face. She looked eerily beautiful. I'll utterly deny your worth in life. She said with a mocking tone, then turned on her heel, heading for the clinic's exit. Her chilling words left me frozen in place. The smell of blood permeated the examination room. You can't go, get treated. Bob tried to stop her, but Michelle pushed his hand away. 
Why does she despise me so much? To the point of denying my worth as a doctor. Why? Why do you reject me to this extent? I can't just let Michelle leave like this. With a pleading tone, I called out to a retreating figure. Michelle halted for a moment. Without turning back, she began her story. A long time ago, there was a skilled doctor in a rural clinic in a declining mountain area. A major hospital pleaded with him to perform surgery on my younger brother, but he walked out without operating. Listening to Michelle's words, I was dumbfounded. I was so shaken I could barely stand, collapsing to the floor. My brother's name was Johnson, and the doctor's name, it was DR, Kevin Thompson. I hadn't forgotten it since that day. After saying that with evident disdain, Michelle brushed past the attempts of Catherine and Bob to stop her and left the clinic. My head started pounding, and I couldn't even stand. I hadn't forgotten either. The name of that patient, Johnson. Back in the day, I was transferred from a university hospital to a rural clinic in the mountains, and admittedly, I was a bit jaded. At that university hospital, I was rather arrogant, considering myself a cut above the rest of my peers. Being told to get experience in a remote mountain clinic didn't sit well with me immediately. Every time a complicated surgery was scheduled, being recalled from the mountain clinic to the university hospital was a hassle. Frankly, I was frustrated every day, and I was angered by the sense that the university hospital was exploiting me. The surgery on that day was for a boy in middle school. He had congenital heart and respiratory problems. If the surgery was successful, he'd get to lead a normal life. I assumed they went into the surgery with hopeful hearts. I realize that now. However, back then, I was full of pride. The surgery wasn't at the university hospital where I worked, but at another university hospital in a different state, requested by my home institution. But when I arrived there, I was met with an unbelievably rude young doctor. Probably around my age, I guess. When I checked in and tried to visit the nurse's station to check on the patient, this doctor immediately confronted me. The doctor introduced himself as Mike and openly sized me up from head to toe. Being young and hot-headed myself, I took offense. Oh, so you work at that little mountain clinic. Why do you come down from the hills today? If you are here for observation, I'd prefer you pick another day. Mike said with a mocking laugh. Come to think of it, the primary doctor for the patient was named Mike. Realizing this smirking guy was the primary doctor made me feel even more irritated. I'm not here for observation, I'm here to work. Mike sarcastically remarked to me, look, the hillbilly's talking. That's his patient. He probably wanted to be the one performing the surgery. Seems like he's taking out his frustration on me. A total stranger. But judging by Mike's behavior, he doesn't seem to realize that I'm the lead surgeon. He's probably trying to chase me away, thinking I'm just some small town doctor from the mountains. We have a top notch surgeon coming in tomorrow. Small town doctors like you should just scurry back to where you came from, Mike said, looking intently into my eyes and trying to intimidate me. Even after that, he kept mocking me by repeating the hillbilly and refused to listen to my explanation. Being young and prideful, I lost it. At that moment, I think I completely forgot about the patient. All I could think about was my wounded pride. I wanted to shout at him that the only reason I was there was because he wasn't skilled enough to handle the surgery. Overcome with anger, I lashed out at Mike. The only reason I'm here is because you don't have the skills for the surgery. If you're going to mock me so much, handle it yourself. Isn't he your patient? Do your best. With that, I turned on my heel and stormed off. How arrogant of me. Mike quickly followed, trying to apologize. Ignoring him, I continued walking until suddenly, Mike stepped in front of me, kneeling down in the middle of the corridor. 
right there in the hallway of the university hospital. It was unheard of, a doctor kneeling down like that. The shocked murmurs of the patients could be heard throughout the ward. I'm sorry, truly, I am. Please, perform the surgery. Save him. I can't do it with my skills, Mike pleaded, his voice strained. Even now, I remember that voice. It was a complete contrast from the arrogant doctor I saw earlier, showing a desperate Mike, trying to fulfill his responsibility to his patient. Yet, I coldly trampled over Mike's feelings. It's a bit late, isn't it? Hang in there, I won't be operating. I declared this while looking down at Mike, who was prostrating himself before me. Mike's hunched back trembled slightly. In the end, I didn't perform the surgery and went back to my own clinic. I prioritized my pride and left the patient. A regret I can never fully shake off. The surgery Mike later performed was a failure. The boy, who only wanted a normal life, ended up bedridden for life. Although it may sound arrogant, I believe there could have been a different future had I been the one to operate. I'm a failure as a doctor. Turns out, the patient was Michelle's younger brother. What a cruel joke fate plays. Michelle, who vehemently rejected my treatment. I'm a man who's basically negated his worth as a doctor. What should I do? I pondered how to atone for a long time. I think one of the reasons I insist on practicing in remote, declining areas is as a form of penance. Since that incident, any ambition I once had has vanished completely. Doctor, are you all right? Catherine, seeing me slumped, voiced her concerns. She doesn't know the details, but she's very perceptive. I'm sure she's pieced together why I came to this clinic and why I don't return to the university hospital. Yet, she doesn't press for details. Catherine's kindness meant a lot to me today. In the end, Michelle never returned to the clinic, and our office hours ended for the day. After closing, I reached out to Bob to check on Michelle. I was told she's locked herself in her room. I felt a bit relieved when I heard her injuries were at least treated. But one can't be too careful. Tonight, I can only hope nothing happens, I thought, ending my call with Bob. The emergency alert on my cell phone went off late into the night. Having gone through so much, I was lying in bed, drifting in and out of light sleep. Yes, this is Kevin speaking. What is your emergency? I try to make sure my voice doesn't sound grotty, speaking from my gut. Can't make the patients or their families feel uneasy. Doc, it's Michelle. She's really sick. Her fever is sky high. It was Bob on the other end of the call. I immediately jumped out of bed and instructed him to bring Michelle to the clinic right away. I was told that Michelle, in her feverish state, was mumbling something about not wanting to go to the clinic. Without wasting a moment, I hid to the clinic on my moped. By the time I arrived, Catherine had already unlocked the front door for me. Lights were on. Everything was ready. I'm sorry to call you at this hour. To which Catherine replied with a gentle smile, it's our job, after all. The moment I was slipping into my lab coat, I heard the sound of a car pulling into the clinic's parking lot. It seemed Michelle had arrived. Both Catherine and I quickly rushed out to the parking lot. I approached the car and spoke to Michelle, who was slumped in the back seat. She seemed to be in great pain and didn't respond. She was drenched in sweat, obviously trying to bear the pain. We need to get her inside, now. At my instruction, Bob lifted Michelle in his arms and carried her into the clinic. She didn't show the resilience she had earlier in the day. When I examined the wound in the examination room, it was swollen and hot. It looked like she might have caught some sort of infection. I'll do what I can right now. If it's tetanus, it could be serious. I began the treatment promptly. But as I did, Michelle, who had regained a bit of her consciousness, 
suddenly pulled her leg away. I don't want you treating me. In a raspy, low voice, she told me that, and frustration had me clenching my jaw tight. I want to go back and punch the old me. I truly felt that way in that moment. Despite her glazed eyes from the high fever and pain, Michelle glared at me, resisting treatment. I fell to my knees right there and begged Michelle for forgiveness. That I was arrogant in the past, and as a doctor, I regret having done something so inexcusable. I tried to convey that with all my heart and sincerity. Seeing Michelle in pain right in front of me, I, who possessed the means to relieve her suffering, felt helpless. That realization brought tears to my eyes. If I can't do anything for my patient in front of me, what's the point of being a doctor? I came to this clinic to escape. I did something terrible as a doctor and faced the worst consequences. Yet, I couldn't give up being a doctor. I may be flawed, but I can help you now. It might not look cool, but I pleaded with Michelle through my tears. Then, her once hostile eyes softened just a bit. Please let me treat you. Please tell me it's okay for me to be a doctor. My voice cracked, and I wasn't even sure she heard me at the end. But I was desperate. Michelle then suddenly extended her leg towards me. Treat me, it's unbearable. She spoke clearly, though she was looking away. Certainly, thank you. I quickly wiped away my tears, got up, checked the wound, and began the necessary treatments. By the time the Ford rip was done, Michelle's condition stabilized, and the painkiller medication put her to sleep. Listening to her steady breathing, I cherished the fact that I could treat her, that she allowed me to be a doctor. The next morning, I woke up feeling someone stroking my head. It was Michelle's slender fingers gently brushing for my hair. Apparently, I had fallen asleep while checking on her. It's embarrassing for a doctor to fall asleep before the patient. However, her gentle touch felt so comforting, I pretended to sleep a little longer. I'm sure Michelle would forgive me. Thinking I was asleep, I could hear Michelle murmuring to herself. I wish he had been a more unpleasant guy. Why is he such a good person? Why was it him who picked up my bikini back then? She murmured, her voice gentle, with a hint of laughter. She's probably recalling that moment. The day I picked up Michelle's bikini. When I said, you dropped something, I had thought she maybe dropped a handkerchief. Taking a closer look at what I had picked up, I unintentionally shouted and tossed it away like a hot potato. After all, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to touch it. A bright turquoise bikini. Michelle, looking very composed, grinned at my flustered self and said, Interested? Want to see me wear it? I might show it to you, mister. In that moment, I fell in love. But now, feeling affection from Michelle's fingers running through my hair, I wonder. In a bit, I'll open my eyes and ask her, did you fall in love with me back then too? I wonder if she'll get angry or laugh. It might come off as self-centered, but I believe Michelle will laugh. I firmly believe that. How did you find today's story? Hitting the subscribe button and the like button helps motivate me to create more content. I'm also looking forward to reading your comments. See you in the next video.